And in that, Jesus gives us what I call a road map, a simple map. God gives a map of the future. It's flawlessly accurate. It's a guide for us to understand history, past, present, and future. And when God Almighty, who rules from heaven over the affairs of man, gave to Daniel this snapshot, God's already seen it. And God says, what I told Daniel is what's going to be. So what does God tell Daniel? Well, basically, God tells Daniel there are only four world empires. Now you say, wait a minute, wasn't there an Akkadian empire? Wasn't there an Assyrian empire? Weren't the Chinese? I thought the Chinese were. Wasn't there an empire in the Indus Valley? Uh, wasn't there the great, you know, you've all heard of Timbuktu, you know, as if it's, it's a mythical place. No, it's a real place in Africa, and there was a huge African empire laced with gold and ivory and highly civilized in Africa that's not mentioned. Why does God mention that there are only four empires from Daniel to the end of human history. Because God says all of history revolves around his people, his chosen people of promise. Let me show you what I mean. I'll give you a real quick. Now, I don't want to go very long in this. I am watching the clock. But remember, I, am a, I did most of my doctoral work in history. I could talk about history until all of you fell asleep. In fact, you should have seen me speaking at the nursing home. I felt right at home, you know. They're dropping like flies, falling asleep while I was talking. But, um, uh, you know, uh, God only sees four world empires because, number one, the reason Babylon is first is Babylon is the one that took and marked the beginning of what God calls the times of the Gentiles. Up until Babylon, God was fighting for and with Israel. I've told you, if you've ever been on Sunday nights talking about David, that David was the most amazing fighter there ever was. You know King David? David never lost a battle and he was never wounded in battle, yet he fought sword fights. David won every battle he went in. Some of them, he didn't even have to do anything. God fought the war for him. Like when the, the sound came in the trees and all the Philistines were scared to death and left all their images behind and David burned them up. God said, if you will do what I say, you'll never lose a battle. And the, the Israelites never lost anybody in the conquest of Canaan unless they were disobedient. They could go to war and you could send your sons to Afghanistan and Iraq and nobody got injured or killed. How would you, I mean, war is nice that way, if only the bad guys get it. That's what God said, if you will obey me. But Babylon was God's instrument that wiped out Israel because they wouldn't obey him. And when Babylon became an empire, the, what the Bible calls the times of the Gentiles, that's a biblical expression, began. This is when God says, okay, I am stopping my work with my chosen people of promise, the Jews. I am temporarily setting them aside. I'm letting them become the wandering Jews. And they're going to live in every country of the world. They're never going to find a home. They're going to be persecuted. They're going to be troubled. They're going to wake up in the morning, wish it was night. At night, they wish it was morning because they're going to be always pogromed and holocausted until the end. And that's, I just gave you Jewish history. Only they put a lot more detail in. That's why this is the first empire. Because this is the empire God said starts the times of the Gentiles. And, and because Jerusalem is his focal point of all history. They, after only, what is that, 27, 66 years, that's all they lasted. This, and, and you see the ending of each of these, marks the beginning of the next. The Medo-Persians, now the Babylonians were really an amazing empire. Lots of gold, lots of building, you know, over in Iraq. The Medo-Persians were a huge empire. And they had a million-man army that lost to the Greek empire. Alexander's 20 or 30,000. That would have been a battle to see. You know what Her the Herodotus and other great historians tell us? That when the army of the Medo-Persians, do you know what they wore to battle? Turbans and flowing, wide-legged uh, Persian trousers, cloths. They met Alexander the Great, who was a lightning speed mounted cavalry covered with bronze armor and bronze swords, and these guys had spears, wooden. So they're marching, the million of them, and Alexander just comes through, and, and I mean, you just hold the sword out, and you just, 
I mean, it's easy to go through cloth with brass razor sharp sword and, you know one on each side just mowed them down and Alexander completely wiped out this empire that lasted for about 200 and some years and the Greek Empire came and the Greek Empire what's fascinating if you know anything about Alexander you know he only lived to be 32 and he died in a dissipated malaria driven drunken orgy but Alexander had five of his generals that fought over the empire but God said only four we're going to get to divide his empire. And you know what? If that fifth one would have won out, the word of God would have been wrong, but God already has seen and decreed. And so Alexander's empire ended in 63. If you remember when Pompey, you all knew Pompey, didn't you? Uh, the Roman victorious general wiped out the, the Greek army. That started what is in history, the beginning of the Roman Empire. Now notice this, that the metals get increasingly stronger, but cheaper. Gold is most malleable, you can bite it, you know, on uh, westerns. Silver is stronger, bronze is hard. Iron breaks bronze, bronze can cut silver. Silver is stronger than gold. But look at these empires, but when did Rome end? See, a lot of people don't pay attention to history. Classic history tells us in 476 AD. No, Rome didn't end. It's just the person sitting on the throne of the king of Rome was a pagan. One of the, you know, remember there were the Vandals and the Huns and the Goths and the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths and the Gothgoths, you know. There were all these pagan Germanic tribes that came down and basically Rome was living, you know, the Romans were just drinking and carrying on and having night and day parties and they killed the king and a, one of the Vandals, one of the pagans became the head of Rome. So Rome didn't end. In fact, Remember in the statue that God gives, there are two legs to the statue. And if you remember, this is the Roman Empire. I'm not a good artist. My dad was an artist, I'm not an artist. But this two legs of iron, there was an Eastern Empire and a Western Empire of Rome. And the, the Western, I mean, I mean Rome, the 476 was the Western, which kind of dissipated in 476, but Constantinople, while Christopher Columbus was working on his plans to come and find us, or the New World, there was still a Roman Empire in Constantinople. Did you know it existed till 1453? And it really never ceased to exist, it just got dispersed. In fact, every piece of the old Roman Empire has had its day running the whole world. The Spanish, you know, with all their colonies. The, the Germans with the Holy Roman Empire and of course, you know, all the, Napoleon with France. They all conquered. The greatest of all was Britain, one of the furthest parts of the Roman Empire. Britain ruled the largest empire the world's ever had. But no one has ever been able to unite the whole thing. And what God says is there's a future time coming and the well, I'll show you. Instead of telling you, I will show you because Jesus explains that. So real quickly, some of you think we'll never get out of here. Uh, Daniel 3, uh, I mean Daniel 2 shows the gold and silver and that. If you read Daniel 7, God shows the very same four empires, but it's from his perspective. Have you ever heard a man describe something and a woman describe something? When, when humans describe world empires, they say, oh, they're golden, they're silver, they're shiny brass. God calls them beasts that bite and devour. See, God looks at how you treat people. And, and in chapter seven, God calls all those empires beasts. But look at Daniel nine. That's where I want you to turn. Daniel nine, verse 24. This is the most amazing prophecy. And if you wonder where dispensationalism and prophetic and Hal Lindsey and, and anybody that, you know, that believes biblical prophecy, you know, like Dallas Samuel and Walvert and John MacArthur, or anybody like that, this is where they get it from. And what I'm gonna show you in, Ma in Daniel nine, 24 is, how God, look at this, God connects the Roman Empire that was, that was in the time of Christ, in the past, to the Roman Empire that's coming in the future. Now you say, who thought that? Hal Lindsey? Mm -mm. This is what Jesus talks about. And, and the way we see that is right here. Look at Daniel 9, 24. First thing to learn, God is very clear. Remember I told you the big box with 1,200 pieces, it gets confusing. The Lord just has three numbers for us this morning. Here's the first one, 70. 
God says everything, everything about the future is 70 weeks. This word, this Hebrew word, is actually the word for a seven, and it's actually what we would call a heptad. Now, you, you think in terms like this, only we have dozens. Those are twelves. Or we like tens, you know. We like our, our numeric system, inches or dozens, but, but all other numbers we like in tens, and, and that's how we do our math. The Jewish mind, God communicates in sevens. You said he does? Yeah. Seven fat cows, seven skinny cows, seven lean years, seven fat years. Remember all the stuff with Joseph's dream. Then we get to the, the descriptions of the Jewish calendar. They had seven days in the week. And when you had seven or six years, the seventh year was a Sabbath year. And, and all of this calendar of Israel, including the Jubilee year and everything else, was all heptatic. That's in sevens. So think about what this says. 70 weeks, 70 weeks, so 52 weeks are in a year, so you have 70, and so you have approximately 18 weeks left. That's an 18. It won't do it. There we go. Well, it is kind of an 18. So we're talking about one year and a third of a year. Okay, let's see if that works. One year and a third of a year are determined for your people, that's the Jews, and for your holy city, that's Jerusalem. Remember, who is he talking to? He's talking to Daniel. Daniel's people were the Jews. His holy city that he turned and opened his window to was Jerusalem. So we're talking about the Jews in Jerusalem, and it says 70 weeks are determined to do all this stuff, and he continues, and he says, Know therefore from the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, that's Jesus Christ, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Back to our simple numbers. I told you there's only four of them. 70 weeks, and he says, will be seven and 62. Now, does 70 equal seven plus 62? Yes or no? What's missing? Okay, now let me show you. Because right there is why Calvary Bible Church is a dispensational church, which means we believe what the Bible says. Look at this. From the command to restore and build Jerusalem. What is that? That's Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. That is when Artaxerxes allowed Nehemiah, his cupbearer, to go back and rebuild the walls and make Jerusalem a sovereign place with rules, I mean with gates and walls and someone that's governing it living inside. It hadn't been that way. But that command actually happened, if you, you can even look it up on, you know, the, the uh, most unreliable source of all, Wikipedia, and it'll tell you that it's 445 or 444 BC. And like a broken clock, it's right twice a day, you know. And, and so that occurred in 445 BC. Until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So God says there are 70 somethings. Well, 445 BC, when, did, when was Jesus crucified? Well, either, depending on, you know, if you listen to Chuck Swindoll or Dallas Seminary or John MacArthur or whoever, it's somewhere between 30 and 33 AD. And that's because of the lunar, you know, Passover, it's, it's a lunar calendar. And to have Friday be the day he's crucified, you have to look for when that would be. And because of that, 30 or 33 AD is the common conservative view. 445 BC, so you have 445 years, you get 30 more. Wow. That's not, that's, that means that these weeks are not weeks of days or weeks of weeks. They're years. Heptads are years. So what it's saying is God has, back up here, whoop, right there it is. God says, I have 70 weeks. I have 400 and 90 years, 490 years planned until the world ends. Now, do you see where everybody, you know, gets all these wild, zany ideas? Watch what happens. He says, there is a command, and until Messiah the Prince, Jesus, something happens to him, seven weeks 
and 62 weeks. That takes us, 7 and 62 is only 69 weeks, or uh, the 483 years. And did you know what? If you calculate in, it's 475, but we operate on the Gregorian calendar, and we have to realize that they had first a solar calendar, then they had the Julian calendar, then they went to the Gregorian calendar, and if you want to take the time and look at a good study Bible, you'll find that it exactly comes down not just to the year, but from this command until Christ marched into town on Palm Sunday is exactly 173,880 days, which is exactly 490, 360 day years. But that doesn't matter. We've covered that many times on Sunday night. What's missing still? One. Now watch what the rest of this says. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So if you had the other verse, it's 7 and 62. So after 69 weeks, 483 years, Messiah will be cut off. What's that? It's the crucifixion. Now look at this. This is what we're getting to Jesus' quote. Not for himself. Jesus was a substitute. And the people of the prince who is to come, uh uh-oh, anybody can figure this out. The people that destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, who was that in AD 70? Who killed 1.1 million Jews? And who leveled the city of Jerusalem? And who quelled the Jewish revolt? Rome. So when it says the people, it's Rome. The Roman Empire. That's the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary after Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified in 30 AD, and 40 years later, in 70 AD, the Romans came and said, enough is enough, Jews, and deported anybody that survived, but killed a million one, 100,000. Wow. But notice what it says. This is the Antichrist. This is the one who is the worst human that will ever live. He is the prince of the people who destroyed the city and the sanctuary. Now, look what Jesus says about him. Then he, who is the he? Here, he's called the prince that will come. If we had enough time and I took you through chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 11, he's called a lot of other names. He's called the little horn. He's called the one with the fierce countenance. He is called the, the uh, abomination that makes desolate. Do you remember when we looked in Matthew 24? Jesus said, when you see this, this abomination that causes desolation in the temple, what temple would he be in? Well, look what happens. He the Antichrist, or the beast of chapter 13 of Revelation, he confirms a covenant with many. How many? Well, how many Muslims are there? 1.2 billion. How many Jews are there? 7 million. This man, not only is the, the Antichrist, not only the worst human that ever lived, he's also the smartest and most clever. And you know what he gets? He gets the 1.2 billion Muslims to shake hands with Israel and they say you can build that temple you always wanted up there in Jerusalem you can build it not just that he allows them to sacrifice and offer to God do you want to know what would cause World War III today if you got the Jews up by the Dome of the Rock slitting some lamb's throat and burning it all Muslim hell would break loose for that This man, he makes a peace covenant with Israel and the world. How does he make it? He is the prince who is to come of the Roman. This is where, if you've ever heard of the revived Roman Empire, the the dispensationalists didn't think of it. God says it. But what is it? Well, there are 70 weeks Seven of them are gone, 62 of them are gone, you already did the math, one of them is left. A week of years is seven years. How long is the tribulation? Say it out loud, seven years. Look what it says here. It says, in the middle of the week, 
What is that? That's why if you read the book of Revelation, it says 42 months. What's 42 months? 42 months is three and a half years. What is that? It's 1,260 days. What is that? It's from the middle to the end of seven years. What is the seven years? It's the 70 weeks God has planned for his people minus the 69 that are already accomplished that ended at the cross, meaning there's one week of human history, seven years left on the clock. But it's an indeterminate time between the cross in AD 30 and today, the Lord has allowed us in the church to thrive to go to every kingdom and tongue and tribe and nation and share the gospel. But there's a moment coming when God is going to call back every demon that's out in the universe and the devil himself and confine all of them to planet Earth. That period of time is one week or seven years long. And for the first three and a half, this guy is doing this. He's making everybody happy. He's using the NSA records and you gotta worship or whatever he uses, you know, to, to make sure no one can buy or sell. And he's putting himself up as the global peacemaker. He gets the Jews sacrificing in Jerusalem, but he breaks his word in the middle and turns on the Jews. And that is the seven year tribulation, the second half, which is horrific, which culminates with the abomination which makes desolation.